Hi, everyone. Welcome to Enritsu Unplugged number six. My name is Linda Reinertz with Enritsu, and I'm an integrated marketing manager. And I'm pleased to be able to talk today to Adnan Khan, who's the director of advanced technology marketing here at Enritsu. Adnan, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. What is MTN and why has it become recently such a hot technology topic? Well, thank you very much, uh, Linda. So what NTN is, if you look at it, is, is basically uh, it has been around for, you know, many, many years, right? It's since the early days of satellite communications, you know, whether uh, we were using GPS, we we're using satellite elevation, we we're using satellite communication equipment, or we were using, you know, when you're flying in the air, you have uh, internet service to satellites, right? Uh, plus, you know, military defense applications, Anything, you know, the concept of connecting globally through a network of, uh, you know, satellites that are interconnected, um, you know, that has been there quite some time, but it's been expensive. It's not been available for everybody. Uh, it requires complex and expensive uh, infrastructure. It requires specialized RF technology. It will require dedicated systems, um, you know, for that specific use, whether it's a military use, it's a defense use, it's a commercial use. It's a use on, on ships, for instance, uh, for marine communication. So for this reason, com the commercialization was not feasible until recently, right? Very recently, um, the non-terrestrial networks or NTN, you know, if you can think of it, it's uh, wireless communication systems that are operating above the Earth's surface. So you have the Earth, here is Mother Earth, right? And then you have different satellites. Now, the satellites can be in different orbits. Satellites are always going around the Earth, right? That's one thing to remember, right? Um, the satellites could be, you know, 36,000 kilometers high in the sky or in the space for that matter. Um, and you could have satellites that are called geosatellite, which is geostationary Earth orbit, or you could have geosynchronous satellite orbit, which is GSO. So GEO is a subset of GSO. They are both at 36,000 kilometers. The difference is the geo satellites, they are right above the equator. So when the earth is moving, you can see the satellite is going to move at the same time. So for a user who is, you know, um, on the ground, it looks like the satellite is always on top of them, right? GSO, on the other hand, it's not right above the equator. It's either north of the equator or it's south of the equator, but it's also moving and it kind of moves in an eight pattern. Uh, so it looks like to the user that you know the satellite is moving but moving very very slowly but it's still at thirty six thousand kilometers it's an inclination to to the equator right so that's your geo and you probably need about three geos or three to six geos to come to basically um, cover the entire uh, earth surface pretty much then you have other satellites you come from geo you come to meo which is you know the medium earth orbit about fifteen thousand kilometers then you have leo which is about you know two thousand kilometers and then you have VLEO, which is very low Earth orbit, about 450 kilometers, right? And then you have the other HAPS platform, which you call high altitude platform systems. Uh, you have UAS, about eight kilometers, uh, which is uh, unmanned aerial system. So you could have, you know, robot taxis or so, uh, aerial robot taxis. And then you have drones that we are all familiar with. So these are different objects. Uh, they have different satellites that are used for communication. Uh, but the key thing to note why it's a hot topic is the fact that there, the key benefit, you know, the NTN is bringing is, you know, it's as I uh, think about is, is how to expand the service. You know, how can you have the scalability of service? And when I say scalability of service, I'm referring to, so you have an event happening in a country, you want to broadcast that event to every user in that country or maybe in a geographic area, right? So that is scalability. And then you can have uh, service continuity. You know, you, you go on cruises. You go in the plane, you want to make sure that you have the same quality and same level of service that you had when you were, you know, on the ground. Um, you go on a cruise and then you come back from the cruise back to the ocean or wherever you're um, going to. You want to maintain that level of connectivity. You don't want to pay an arm and leg to have Internet connectivity with your loved ones while you're on the on the cruise. Right. Uh, as well as for, you know, areas like if you want to do some kind of tracking from a commercial perspective, you know, not an individual, but enterprise use cases, you want to track a package, you know, that is being shipped across the ocean and you want on real time tracking where exactly it is from a location perspective. 
So that's um, the service continuity. And then we have what we call service ubiquity, right? So you want to have coverage everywhere. And that's where it actually started from two years ago when NTN became all of a sudden very important. I was, you know, in areas whereby you could have a disaster or areas whereby you are and you have no coverage. You are in some national park or you are some in cave area, remote areas um, that you have no connectivity, right? So it's very important. Uh, to make sure that you have that level of confidence, you can communicate with your loved ones or emergency services for that matter. And, and as you can look at it uh, from a global connectivity perspective, you know, 70% of the Earth's surface is all water. And out of that 70, 70%, 95% is ocean. So it's very cross prohibitive in a lot of times for uh, mobile network operators to have infrastructure in those remote areas or those areas um, whereby it's very, very, cost prohibitive to have say a base station you know in a national park on a mountain top or in a cave or in a remote area in a desert or in the ocean it's it's difficult to have that plus it's very difficult to maintain it as well um it may be a lot more cost effective if you have a satellite thirty six thousand kilometers in the sky and can beam down exactly and cover it i have a, maybe three to five hundred kilometers of you know footprint from a beam perspective right so again three areas as i said why it's very important is scalability, continuity, as well as ubiquity, right? Those are the three main areas. And, and you can you will see a lot of applications coming on board, right? As well, we can look at smart agriculture. You can have agriculture farms somewhere in Idaho or in the middle of nowhere, but you don't want to have just service uh, for one or two customers. So you satellite over there. You don't need to have terrestrial network service over there. Other items could be automotive, for instance, right? You know, imagine you're stranded, you lose your keys or you lock your keys in the car. You want somebody to be able to connect your vehicle and remotely open it. Or you can contact somebody from a service perspective. So that's where the automotive part. So at the, we see agriculture, we see automotive, we see utilities, um, you know, being a very important part of uh, non-terrestrial networks. That's really important. You know, you brought up a lot of really interesting use cases I hadn't considered. The the emergency services and the automotive it's very interesting one question though is there any concern about interference with airplanes i know thirty six thousand kilometers is really high but some of those other ones you talked about are a little bit lower and i'm wondering how they negotiate that yeah it's a very good question linda so yes it's everything is a high liability if you look at it right so if you have airplanes it's very high liability so we want to make sure that there is not any kind of interference happening with the different frequencies that the different components of the aircraft are operating at, right? So we have the L band, we have the S band, K band, KU band that may be used by satellites. So two things, we wanna make sure that the satellite communication with the terrestrial network or with the device on the ground does not interfere in any way, shape or form with first, with the objects that are in the sky, which could be other satellites. It could also be uh, aircraft, as you mentioned. It could be drones as well. And the other part, it should not interfere with the networks that are on the ground because that signal from the 36,000 kilometers is gonna come down to the ground. Um, and you wanna make sure the other folks who are using the terrestrial network, they have the same level of uh, service. So those are very, very key points to have the right amount of spectrum planning, spectrum management, as well as interference scanning done, you know, when a network is designed and getting deployed. Thank you so much, Anand. That's a lot of really good information on a very interesting and hot topic. So thank you again, and please stay tuned for the next episode coming up shortly.